Wallace, of course, was one of those intelligent people, but he seemed to go beyond the intelligence. His, his intelligence and his experience and his aims in life seemed to have uh, given him uh, wisdom that some of the other people didn't have. I mean, a lot of people have wisdom, but I think he was one of the people that transcended intelligence into wisdom. For Wally, his primary weapon was the written word. Every now and then he would write a paragraph that we would be using on materials that we sent out or that we presented. And so he was kind of constantly this um, figure of, of, of wisdom, thoughtfulness and wisdom, if you will. Uh, very, very pleasant person to be around. I suppose the thing that comes to me most often is his conviction that he was doing the right thing. He cared about the environment, but there, and it was always a matter of a, a, a sense of justice and a sense of wanting to do the right thing. And always he would feel, you would feel that he, he couldn't believe more in what he stood for than he did. He just was amazing in his conviction and, and the, the um, what, what he was about to do. He did it with grace and he did it with humor and he just, he showed us the way. <laughs> He was such an engaging person. I mean, the material he gave was so human and you felt that you'd known him as well as the people he was talking about a long time because he was so sensitive to them and what he was talking about. And then it turned out when Carl and I were married and then we moved up and built this house, he was just a neighbor down the way. My wife is a pretty good bird dog. She, she is. <laughs> snooped around in here until we found this little patch of land on top of a hill where we've lived now, I guess, almost 20 years. It still remains pretty much the horse pasture that it was when we first moved out. We don't have any horses anymore. We had five for a while. Finally, I decided it was the horses or my back, and I gave up the horses. <laughs> I love their spot up on the hill there in Los Altos uh, and the view they had and the simplicity, I think, uh, of the way they lived and uh, the way they enjoyed that connection with the environment. So that, to me, was a reflection of how he could change his opinion and I would dare say I probably moderated some of my feelings uh, too with regards to the environment. The his presence as a man will always overpower the effect of the writing on me. You know, I, I, I love reading. I'm a voracious reader and, uh, and it, so I've read a lot of other people along with Wally, but Wally has been such an influence on my life that, it, that his personality overshadows the writing. The things that he said were more important to me. Well, the first bit of writing that we did together was a special issue of the uh, Atlantic Monthly called Rocky Mountain Country. And the editor then, I've forgotten who it was, but thought it would be cute to have a father and son team. I had written three novels and so I had a little, uh, a, a little experience writing, but uh, I had never written any nonfiction. So we said sure, and we divided up the West into uh, states, and each took our respective uh, assignments and went off. And I actually knew absolutely nothing about a the West or b writing nonfiction, and uh, but I I soldiered on and did my part, and then uh, gave gave it to my father for his his to to do a kind of overall editing of the, of the st stuff. It was the entire issue. It was, you know, 50, 60,000 words. And when I saw it the next time after he'd gone through it, I didn't recognize a word I'd written. <laughs> he had completely rewritten me. And I was, uh, I was a little annoyed, actually. But in retrospect, I, I realized what a favor he did me. Uh, 
Um, and I learned an awful lot in, in the process, both about the West and then about writing nonfiction. I met Wally Stegner through the Committee for Green Foothills, and I was already beginning to be embroiled in the great power line controversy about the 220,000 volt power line that goes across Skyline. The Committee for Green Foothills had just been formed. I had uh, appealed to the Sierra Club to help me fight that battle and got nowhere with that. The Sierra Club was not a, a politically active organization. This is 1962. And I had heard about this organization that had been formed called the Committee for Green Foothills that really was out to protect the hills. And I was invited to a meeting of the committee and the board, and that was the first time that I, I met Wally. And I had heard that he had uh, been a co-founder of it, and of course I knew who he was. I was at Stanford and Wally was at Stanford, but quite different departments. I'm in physics, Wally English. And I knew he was a great person, but I didn't meet him that way. I met him as a, just one of the people in the room, this marvelous group, Lois Hogel and Wally and a number of the others who were the originators. And she said, before we get much further, we should pick a name for our organization. And uh, Kathy came up with the idea, well, why don't we call it the Committee for Green Foothills? Oh, that's a good name, said Wally. And so that's what we came that very first night. We had that because she said, if we were going to become a political action group, which we would have to be, we'd have to have a name that we could be referred to. And so from that night, and I think all of us felt very good about that because, you know, there was nothing uh, uh, indicating which way we were going. It just the Committee for Green Foothills, keep things green. He came to visit Sunset in the film, video film called Looking In on Sunset. And it started up at his home with some observations about Sunset that he and Mary shared. And Gene can speak to that point later that uh, uh, he was very mindful of. And so he the format of the film was that he came down to visit Sunset, came into the lobby, asked for Bill Lane, Bill Lane comes out. Uh, Semi-rehearsed, but uh, no script. And uh, of course it was edited and uh, turned out to, I think to be about a 15 minute film. And it was shown all over the country and uh, he loved it. And uh, he sent out a lot of copies to people he'd uh, taught with and uh, been with in different relationships. Oh, that was a splendid article, I remember it. Uh, you know, I used to have a feeling, maybe 20 years ago, that Sunset itself never took strong enough positions on things. It seems to me I detect a change, this kind of article in which you, you lay out a problem in all its ramifications. Well, actually, the Tahoe article is most recent, and it has had a lot of attention. Copies were made, mailed to all the members of Congress, and it's had a great impact. I think that's why Wallace invited me out, so I wouldn't start talking, and I wouldn't interrupt, and... The I was just the fly on the wall. And I photographed oh, three or four rolls that day. And I, that was the day I took the one that's been used the most, the, the photograph of, uh, of uh, Wallace with the uh, Scandinavian sweater. And that's, I've had to make hundreds of prints of that. I think it was Bob Stone. This was before angle of repose and before crossing to safety. And while he, while he was famous, and certainly famous among literati and famous among college writers, he wasn't famous in the way that Philip Roth was famous. And, and we were drinking bourbon, and, which Wally liked, and, and Bob said, Wally, what would you do if you ever had a tremendous big bestseller, you know, a book of the month club, movie hit and everything? And without hesitating, two seconds, well, he said, I'd quit teaching and I'd change my bourbon to Jack Daniels Black. <laughs> well, my father and I happened to be asked to be on the Today Show because we, were, uh, we had written a couple of pieces together. And we went up to San Francisco to a studio and, and sat in the makeup artist chairs and so forth and then went on the show. And we were so incredibly boring that Hugh Downs decided to cut it completely out of the show and we were never we never saw ourselves on television together that was 
I don't know why we were so boring, but we thought we were pretty lively, but he didn't, so that was it. They were always, always very, very uh, uh, humorous and very friendly and warm. Always had something good to say about what we were doing. And I, we always loved to have, we had them here several times, and they were just, a, well, adorable people, both of them, both Mary and Wally. He and Mary hosted us often. We were at their house. Mary was a love, too, and I loved seeing them together. They, they were, there was this extraordinary bond of the two of them together. Mary also wouldn't say much, but occasionally he would look at her and then something would be said or she would throw in a comment. And I got the sense of this uh, wonderful, loving, deep team. A large group of us from the Committee for Green Foothills took a, got it, rented a bus or what do you call it, uh, uh, organize it. And there were 53 of us that went up to the opera house, to the opera that had been made from uh, Wally's book, The Angle of Repose. And uh, during the course of it, they told who wrote the music and who did the libretta. And I turned to Wally and I said, well, why don't they tell you it's from your book? It's no longer my book because it's now theirs. And I said, well, that's not fair. And he said, well, that's the way life is. So we listened to the beautiful music. It was well done. And everybody in the audience, there were a lot of, uh, I'm sure, Wally fans there too. And so I suggested, why don't we all rush out? Don't stand and talk to people to go to the entry. And when he comes out, yell, author, author. Well, we did that and Wally was just stunned. I think he was pleased, but he was so surprised. And afterwards, he wrote the dearest note saying that was the most thrilling part of the evening, coming out to hear his name called Wally, the author, author. And he responded very well. He liked the interaction between the Marx Brothers and the round table at the Algonquin. That was, he just loved the whole George S. Kaufman, uh, Mary McCarthy, that, that whole thing. The interaction of them with Harpo Marx was a source of tremendous hilarity to him. He just loved that whole period. And, and, and of, the, of the, the side, he liked Harpo's side. <laughs> the best thing. He was such a, a delightful person. And uh, then when he uh, started teaching uh, his creative writing classes, that's when he really was in great demand because everybody wanted to be part of them. And, and I know, I think this last year they had over 7,000 applicants for that creative writing program. And you could see what a, uh, a difficult thing it would be for them to follow. And I think now they have about five teachers doing the things that he used to do. We certainly bought in to his creative writing department, and I would lecture over there. And then later, and Jean can describe this, she mentioned it earlier about uh, being so enthusiastic while he was still alive, vital, and very dynamic uh, to start sponsoring this uh, uh, lecture series in his honor. Uh, the creative writing um, lecture series that Bill and I sponsored in 1981 through these last uh, 22, it'll be 22, 23 years, uh, have included um, Wendell Berry, Ray Carver, we had Nadine Gordimer, we had Seamus Haney, uh, John Irving, Doris Lessing, uh, Peter Matheson, Larry McMurtry, Tony Morrison, Grace Paley, Octavio Paz, Robert Pinsky, Adrian Rich, and of course, Wally Stegner, we subsequently have been sponsoring now for a number of years another lecture series, first in his honor and now in his memory, uh, with the Peninsula Open Space Trust, uh, which primarily focused on writers like he was, great writers, but also involved in the environment. And that series um, is, uh, is also on an annual basis, which Gene and I sponsor, and in both of them, it's out of our tremendous respect for him and uh, also for his wife, Mary. And the other thing that he disparaged was, quote, fine writing. And he used it in quotes all the time. He hated quotations other than first quoted speech. And he would tell you, 
don't use quotation marks for anything but quoted speech. That's right out of Strunk and White, which is good advice for any writer anyway. The phrase fine writing, which while he used in quotes, even when he wrote about it, he would put it on somebody's uh, paper and he would say, quote, fine writing. And that was the worst uh, insult that he could give to you because he hated self-consciously, uh, let's see, what do I mean? Writing which used words which were not plain, direct, to the point, and again with Strunk and White, words of two syllables where one would do, or most often writing that was meant to address a particular class of literati. One day Bob Stone who became a fellow and he read the first chapter of The Hall of Mirrors and I think the chapter is just titled Geraldine and it was incredibly affecting and Bob Stone has a, re a voice that you would pay anything for. He reads like Dylan Thomas reads and with a wonderful voice and he read this chapter and the whole room was just completely silent. There were about eight of us sitting around this big table at the top of the old library at Stanford. And when he finished reading, Wally said, I wish I'd written that. <laughs> Wally, as everyone knows, was a sort of quiet, thoughtful thinker. And he would be quiet for quite a while during discussions. And we would all wait. We learned, I learned, I'm sure the others already knew, with sort of bated breath for when Wally would come out and say something because at that point he would have digested what we were talking about and his, his uh, English language was as beautiful as his written language, his spoken language, and he would just in a few sentences be able to distill the essence of what we were talking about and um, to approve or to steer the discussion a little bit. What he, what he was mostly about, he had convictions and the convictions that he had were very, very uh, pure and very real. And if you were a little bit um, not quite sure of, of your place and what you, were, what you really believed, I think after you talked with Wally about it, he had such a, a way of, well, he spoke with great sincerity and depth. Always you knew that he had thought about it. He had given it real time, and he, he shared that depth of insight with people at every point. Wally's importance to the committee really transcended greatly his, uh, his verbal contributions at any moment, just his presence and his support, and knowing that his mind was engaged on what we were all doing and helping. Um, it made everything larger in a way. It's, it's difficult to describe, but it, the meetings would have been very different without Wally in the room. Wally just encouraged me and encouraged me and encouraged me, and all of this subs, sub, subterranean ambition from when I was a kid came flooding back. And so since then I've written eight books and 100 papers and lots of magazine stories and articles. And, and he was really, pers his, his presence was as responsible for that as any dictum, as any prescriptive. Beside, beside the, uh, the wisdom, that I thought one word that, that uh, described Wallace, the other word that described him was grace. And I couldn't remember all the things, but in the, uh, the Webster's Dictionary, they described grace as goodwill or kindness. A disposition to oblige another. Elegance with appropriate dignity. A charming trait or accomplishment. Attractiveness. Ease of movement. Charm of bearing. I think wisdom and grace are the two words that I would use to describe Wallace Stegner.